Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's uh, General Gary Brito. Gary, please, on the, the Army's 49th G1. And as General Swan mentioned, been in the job for about 18 months now. Uh, I am not a medical professional, but I'm a soldier and a leader just like many of you today, whether in uniform now or having served in uniform. And Scotty, thank you for the invitation to, to speak to this August group today, it's an intelligent group as well. Uh, not only do I get to work with Scotty Daly, uh, Scotty Daly, I'm also his next door neighbor. And this morning I filed a lawsuit because all those leaves blew on my side of the yard. <laughs> we got we to gotta fix that, okay, Scotty? <laughs> okay. Our team, it is indeed an honor to spend some time with you today. I know I'm going to keep us on time, and if you don't mind, this is my slide, and that's what we're going to go with today. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the nexus, and these are my words, between medical readiness, holistic fitness, and readiness of the Army. And some of these may not be doctrinal lingo, quite frankly, as I discuss it, but what I'd like to do is connect a, 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 this a true nexus between the wellness of our Army, resiliency and health of our Army, and combat readiness. And at the end of the day, which was suggested in the first panel, I know Scotty and I have talked about it before, you cannot separate that mission of being combat ready from the United States Army, regardless of the component you're in or regardless of the skill set that you're in. And as illustrated in some of the comments and the questions that Sergeant Major and, and uh, General Zingo received this morning as well, the expertise, the professionalism, the dedication, and the passion of everybody in the medical field, especially that combat medic, as Sergeant Major Daly talked to, that is, that is at the tip of the spear with that infantry squad, the Bradley, the tank, the medical section, the cook section, it doesn't matter. So you, you cannot separate the combat readiness from the medical readiness. So I'm gonna take a little liberty and call resiliency and health a protective blanket that our entire United States Army needs, all three components. And I'm not gonna, in discussion today, there's no separation between comp two and three in their, in their need to deploy and the reliance uh, that it has on that protective blanket. So with that, and again, just some, some, some personal thoughts, that protective blanket talks to what you do as a medical profession. Everywhere from the recruitment and talent management, I know there's a question on that, I can talk to that as well. Uh, the development of the very best commanders and command, nominative command sergeant majors within the medical field. And General Zing, I don't know if you talked to it, but he just had some candidates, uh, well-deserving, well, highly skilled candidates go through our recent command assessment program at Fort uh, Knox, Kentucky, which is expanding, expanding, and I'm, I truly assess it will deliver the best to the field and identify those that have the privilege of standing in front of soldiers and leading soldiers, regardless of their capacity, and anticipate that it'll continue to get better. But get back to that protective blanket. And I offer this up from some experience, well, I guess all my experience as, as an infantry soldier, and the reliance, and General Brown and others can attest to this, of that medical professional, both in their training, their innovation, innovative thought, and in part of my language, just giving a damn about your job and doing it well. With Especially with this field, knowing that I can turn left or right, and whether it's a medic, a doctor, or a nurse, a dentist, or somebody, uh, whether a, a, a someone behind, with three letters behind your name or just a medical support officer, you know that he or she is gonna give you the very best that they can. So what I like to do is take it from that level up about another thousand feet and talk a little bit, as mentioned in the, in the opening remarks, about people first as an initiative and people first as a priority. And team, I'm gonna offer this up in the context of my words and my thoughts. Although people first is a priority and people first as a philosophy is number one for our chief of staff as well. But I'll also acknowledge that some are confused on what that means. So I'm just going to take a little bit of liberty, maybe a little bit of risk, and talk about it as well. So we have over 1 million, 1.1 million serving in our Army, all volunteers from all 50 states and all territories. And if you look at it as we have a handshake with their loved ones that are supporting them to join, that in essence starts to build why everything we do needs to have a people first focus. And I would offer up and really do believe that the wellness and resiliency offered from professionals like you help build the actual mortar that builds that foundation on taking care of people first. 
And so that puts some seriousness behind what all of us, all of us do. Now, another term, and, and I borrowed this from somebody, if you look at the people first, every soldier, as the number one pacing item that will make this army work and make us combat ready, we're going to give all the attention to them as well. So the innovative thought through the medical profession that you do so well, the giving a damn and taking care of your job when you take care of the soldiers, the army institution, the hospital, the dental clinic, the vet clinic, what have you, will put those people first and treat them like the foundation and the philosophy, uh, the priority that they are to make our army combat ready. So that's an aspect of the people first. So in essence, it is a mindset, a 24 seven mindset it is definitely not an either or. So I offer that up so it'll help us in whatever our profession is to be the best contributor for combat readiness. And that's what this is all about. And I would offer up in my personal thoughts and this brings a connection to health and resiliency being that protective blanket for our soldiers. Can I get a thumbs up? Does that make any sense so far? If not, I'll leave and you can, you, you can have some donuts here. Okay, so I won't do that. So let's connect people first as a philosophy and a priority and how it's important for every modernization effort in the Army. Not, one of our, not only one of our six cross-functional teams, which is largely uh, somewhat, well, it is equipment-based, and it is and already is given as a, a competitive advantage that overmatch that we need from our adversaries. But I know, also know within the medical profession, and you're living it every day, someone behind you is going to live it in a few years, also helps to modernize our health, resiliency, and medical efforts as well. There'll be a new tourniquet that somebody, some young soldiers may dream up in the future. There may be a new uh, practice that'll help us be combat ready. So the modernization that I know through General Dingle's leadership and others and the next Surgeon General one day will continue to advance our modernization efforts as a medical professional, as a medical professional team, but yet feed into the people first as a priority and a philosophy. I know you're getting tired of that tagline, so I won't say it anymore, but the point is those 1 million plus soldiers that join, volunteer to join from everywhere, regardless of their educational background, ethnicity, religion, doesn't matter, is enabled by us putting them as a priority and driving everything we do to enhance that combat readiness, okay? Now, I do feel obligated to say don't confuse with taking care of our people, whether it's through medical assets or efforts with being soft, okay? And quite frankly, uh, in some of the travels I've heard that, hey man, well, why am I sending them home with three, uh, 1,500? That's, take, that's being soft on the soldier. No, 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 it's not. It's making sure that he or she has an opportunity to go to the soccer game, or it's given some calendar predictability that we're going to be away this weekend, let your family know. So it's a balance. And, and our, our leaders have the responsibility to do just that. So I'll take the philosophy and the, and the, and the uh, priority and put it on the shelf for a while and flip back to the medical readiness. Uh, that is so key. Now, health and holistic fitness, uh, largely in, in the experiences I'm having now as the Army G1, I get to live it a lot. Uh, quite a lot. I get to see my neighbor all the time, uh, whether it's in the backyard or VTC, usually in the backyard we solve all the problems, right? And everything goes well. But the holistic and fitness for the, for the combat readiness of our army, I would offer up, probably cannot be separated. Whether it's an aspect of religious fitness, which our chaplain's working well, whether it's what Scotty's doing, what General Dingle's doing in his policies to ensure that our soldiers have the access to medical care that they need, access to medical counseling that they need, innovative equipment to make them uh, be more resilient on the battlefield, infusing the, the medical profession into the training. All of that fits into the holistic and health fitness that our Army needs. So if any of that is in the red or the amber state, I would offer up to you that combat readiness is impacted in a negative way simply. And if it's not infused into the training, not infused into the DNA of the squad, the cook section, the finance section, medical readiness is going to be impacted. Not only from what, it, what that asset may do to save a life, 
but as important, I would offer up the confidence that the soldier, regardless of his or her MOS, is going to have in what you are going to provide them. And that confidence, whether good, whether good or bad, extends to the family members as well. So, which are all part of the holistic readiness of our army, I would offer up to you. So what I'll ask of the uh, a challenge, both myself and any medical professional leader here, is that continue to be innovative, continue to be an expert at your trade, and continue to infuse all of that into the combat readiness of our, of our military. And I'm not using his words, but I can tell you that is near and dear to our 40th chief, our chief of staff of the Army as well, General Combo, who used to be the G1. So occasionally I get some good counseling, which is all good stuff. But you can see where that's very important. Everywhere from the platoon doing the training at Camp XX to one of the major exercises that are going to be going on in Europe soon. Um, so in, in my grunt words, we cannot separate what you offer as a medical professional from the combat readiness of our United States military. Okay, I did drop a hint, but I'll talk to you a little bit more on how this medical profession uh, that we have and what you give as a protective blanket to the United States military clearly links into soldier and family readiness as well. Uh, we have a lot going on in the building and General Dingle can attest to it on resiliency, quality of life, uh, trying to minimize the impact of harmful behaviors. And uh, just to give a, two, a couple examples, sexual assault, sexual harassment, discrimination, racism. I know not so much directly into the medical field, but uh, through behavioral health counseling and medical aspects in many, in many ways, it does touch us as well. And another uh, outcome uh, that we're wrestling with right now is suicide. I am not calling that a harmful behavior, not at all. But the resiliency that our army builds, of which you're part of it, helps to get at some of those conditions that may push a soldier to deciding uh, to commit suicide. And that's a very sad issue. Quite frankly, I'm, matter of fact, I'm going to Capitol Hill this afternoon to talk about suicide. Uh, not to put a Debbie Donner on anybody, but we're at 304 regular uh, Army suicides this morning. And we're 320 is the five-year record. So uh, it's it going to be a community effort, everybody, to include our medical professionals to help us move the needle this way and that issue of suicide for our army. And I uh, haven't quite cracked a nut on it. And more closely in your lane on that is access to behavioral health, how we approach behavioral health. Uh, we do need your help as a medical professional in removing the stigmas from behavioral health. And I know, I know your force is helping to do that. And uh, again, I'll shift off that topic because I don't want to be a Deb Debbie Donner for the day. Uh, but if I may back up just a tad bit on the people first, People first as a priority efforts and philosophy, the connective tissue from the protective blanket that the medical professionals uh, help give us will help be but one more of the building blocks we need for cohesive teams. And that I am offering up from our chief of staff of the Army. Now, I would like to take a little bit of risk and connect the cohesive teams to combat readiness and people first. Again, not an either nor, it's an always. And just a simple example, if you don't have those cohesive teams, you're not going to be effective in combat, period. If we don't have the cohesive teams of which the medic that someone talked to in one of the questions earlier is part of that cohesive teams, you're not going to be combat ready. So this simply builds back to the combat readiness that our Army needs, whether 34 years ago or 34 years from now, it's necessary. And I may be looking at it in some very simple eyeballs as a, as a, as a grunt, but the dignity and respect that builds those cohesive teams, minimizing the harmful behaviors, build those cohesive teams, hopefully bring the needle to the left on suicide, bring those cohesive, builds the cohesive teams. What you offer and trust, confidence, and capability as a, as a medical profession, build those cohesive teams, which is all good. When we detract from that, it's not good, and we won't have the combat readiness uh, that our Army needs. I know many have lived that already. Okay? Okay, and lastly, on the personal thoughts, and I'd like to take some Q&A, and that's the only reason I'm in a little early here. And lastly, I would offer up both as a soldier, as a professional, as a leader, as a husband, and a dad, 
and a dad of a soldier, that what you represent as a medical community, I think is clearly a front line of defense right now. And that's both a personal thought and a professional thought. And if you just look back at all of our history, even recently, even as we, we started to pull out of our Afghanistan and the soldiers we have in Iraq right now, the trust and confidence that the troops, their families, and their commanders have, and what this audience offers as a front line of defense in the, for the, in the medical community has given all of us the trust and confidence in what this profession is going to do. Whether it's the ability to go to the hospital, or knowing that if I get hurt in the sports field, or in combat, I'm gonna be taken care of. I commend you and I salute you what you do as a medical professional, and I'm glad to be part of your team. So with that, that's my one slide. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today, to kind of tie it up where I started. People first is the philosophy, people first is the readiness as a, as a priority, cannot be separated from our ability to be combat ready. It's not an either or, it's an everyday and part of our DNA enabled by what you do every day by giving a damn. Thank you very much. This is a hard question. I'm going to give it to General Dangle. Okay. Yeah. Hello, sir. Joe Robinson, 3rd Medical Command, I'm uh, Compo 3. Um, a lot of times people will join the profession as physicians because of a change in life circumstances or a change in job. And as we know, with, with uh, Gray's Anatomy being the gold standard of what medicine is really all about, <laughs> they had an episode in there where a doctor decides to quit the show, which is a really good idea because it was the only episode I could stand watching. <laughs> he joins the Army, is trained and, or is enlisted, trained in six weeks and sent off to Iraq. He also dies there. That's how they get rid of him off, off the show. But the point being, what are we doing? Are we doing anything to decrease the ascension times for physicians mm -hmm. um, because you, they want to come in because of changes in life circumstances or job circumstances. By the time we go through the process, those, cha those, those uh, changes have, have now no longer an issue mm -hmm. and we lose a lot of physician applicants that mm -hmm. way, sir. In, in broad terms, uh, in, um, I can apply that very good question, Joel, up front. And I'm going to phone a friend in a minute. He's sitting right in front of me here. But uh, we are challenged with uh, attracting, competing, and retaining talent in many aspects, specifically for skill sets such as that, uh, a lot of STEM experts, and some that are just being really sought after, pilots in the civilian sector who, one, get quick money, more money. And what we are working to do is, one, slow that accession plan down, whether it's through a direct commissioning assets or just a process. And then in many aspects, make it more attractive to stay. And not only from the benefits that you get, from just the, the, the true definition of being part of a profession as well. Uh, I, didn't, I know I didn't answer your question well because it is a legitimate problem. That's a good cue for my buddy to stand up. He's going to help out right now. <laughs> so, Joe, you were talking about the accession time that it takes yeah. to bring on our professionals. Yeah. So having you know the former medical recruiting brigade commander um, that has always been a challenge, the time it takes to onboard a direct commission or access a medical provider. One of the reasons is we run into so much uh, issues when we get the background check and we have to get the clearances and um, it takes a while. I just commissioned a, um, a colonel, lieutenant colonel um, in the United States Army, it took over uh, 18 months for us to onboard him way too long and we lose a lot of our providers because they say it takes too long and some have even gone to other services where it did not take as long uh, we have been um studying you know i won't say admiring the problem but studying the issues on how we could expedite it we have not broken the code yet because we still run into so many of the medical malpractice issues that we have to clear when we have a talented wow. provider that we want to bring on but, but those hurdles slow down the process. If it is a clean accession and the provider has nothing in his medical malpractice or the, uh, the data bank issues, um, it's, we're able to bring them on quicker. Not that even the 18 month took so long, but it's also the medical health 
when we go through the um, the physicals that slow things up. And then we have to go through the waiver process. And by the times it gets all the way up from the Mets to USERAC to uh, my team, um, it it's sometimes takes a while because the individual get in the information. Not that that is an excuse on why it takes long, but the bottom line is we have to do better. We're trying to work those, but those few hurdles we can't get around, which lengths out the accession uh, time. But we are trying to do everything we can to, to shorten it so we stop losing key yeah. talented providers. And, and Joe, I would say, uh, outside of the medical topic, we've also, we have to go through Congress to get approved for this. And we have in some specialties, uh, direct hiring access and authorities, which we've been able to do with some. We can try and expand to that. I'd like to give a good, a good example of thorough, thoroughness that General, General Zinkel just talked to as well. I'll protect the identity and the MOS, um, but we have a civilian that we bought on not too long ago, which took a long time. And the process he just talked about identified uh, financial issues, which is why the person wanted to come in the Army. Uh, some serious medical issues that rendered this person uh, com uh, medically unfit that had to be worked through. So the thoroughness of the systems also worked out to be a good checks and balance as well. Okay. Didn't give you what you what you really needed, but uh, point noted, we got to fix this. Sure. Sir, Colonel Harrison, uh, Army War College. So this is actually a question uh, to yourself, General Dingle and uh, Sergeant Major. Okay. The... I apologize. I'm trying to articulate this question a little bit better. Have, have, has anyone ever looked at the ability, talking about the total force for the Guard and Reserve, we're talking about ready medical force and the difficulty they have, right? So the medic, he goes to his AIT, does his training, and then he works at Firestone or some other thing Monday through Friday, right? Um, the Has anyone ever looked at the trying to so we just the, uh, President Biden just signed the HERO Act, right? And so for those leaving, that's a great opportunity for them to get to, uh, signed into the VA. But has anyone ever looked at you utilizing VA type uh, things or other uh, government medical jobs to allow those kids to be able to try and do those, you know, try and create a bridge program to allow those kids to get jobs doing that Monday through Friday in their in their regions? You know, where they're, wherever they're from, whether they're the Guard or Reserve in those areas for that. So if I understand it correctly, so as a soldier in Comp 2 or 3, yes, working through VA or some other medical community to hone their jobs or work to a job? Yes, sir. Trying to, so just for an example, so the uh, mm -hmm. VA has something called the ITC program. It's the Intermediate Care Technician, which is basically their version of taking a, a whiskey and putting right. it to work for that, okay. uh, which is a great initiative started in 2012 by General Sinsucky. That That's a way right, for it. Right. You know, if you're, a, if you're a, a radiology tech or a phlebotomist, you're able to go do those jobs without a problem because you have state licensures or mm -hmm. national certifications, but the whiskeys don't have that. Okay, I just um, And so jobs like that is, is what I'm trying to get after, is giving them the ability to it maintains their readiness, right? So that yeah. it helps them with that. They may not do everything. They're not going to work all the way through table eight, but what they are going to be able to do is maintain some of those skills Monday through Friday versus changing tires or okay. working at Walmart. No, I do understand. I see Sergeant Major jumping at the, chomping at a bit. I'd like to add one, almost a shameless plug, but there's a good reason I'm doing this. This on a, a, a modernization effort called IPSA, Integrated Personal and Pay System Army which we kick the ball across the 50 yard line. We're on this side of the football field, but that's going to give us a level of transparency across all three components that quite frankly, we, we didn't have before. We have a little bit now and it's going to get a lot better. Um, so selectively I can, we can look down across all three compounds and say, Oh, 68 whiskey in Idaho. We didn't know that before. His or her talents can be used uh, for some level of perimeter ability across the components, which is where we're going. And just see some talent, which might feed into our ability to do just that. Yes, sir. Thank you. And and I'll pay you later for that question, sir. Appreciate it. So uh, the short answer is absolutely. And, and it is a concern for us, especially for the six day whiskey. But we have a few things going on. One of those things is right now, uh, one of the SAR majors from our 357 section is actually meeting or met yesterday with the VA to increase those partnerships for that ICT, uh, ITC. And so we're looking at the POIs, how to adapt to what we already have as a 
certification and what we can do to expand that certification and opportunities for our whiskeys to partner with the VA to do that. Step one. Step two, we have something called a SMART program. It's where we, we are partnering with uh, level one trauma centers and sending our um, uh, enlisted medical professionals out to get experience. And now we're looking to expand that to the VA. And we have a, we have a program director that will be looking at that for the team. Third, sitting right over here, we have General Harder, the, the Army Medicine Mighty G357. Her sergeant major uh, yesterday is working with a RAND study that's looking at not only the six-day whiskey, but five other MOSs on, on how we can uh, better uh, partner with the community to increase their uh, certifications to be able to help them do exactly what you just asked. So the short answer is yes. And then last, you spoke about our six-day whiskeys, which are near and dear to my heart, because that's really the sticking point. And again, I go back, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but as medicine increases, as, as we go into multi-domain operations, where, where that medic by themselves are going to have to sit on the X longer and sustain life, it is, it is my strong belief that we have to continue to increase their baseline competencies. And the gold standard for pre-hospital care is the paramedic. So we're doing everything we can to to get our whiskeys to that level. And that would also help with their uh, after Army or during Army Compo 2 and 3 uh, job securities. Cool. Hope that answers your question, sir. Yep. Just a, a quick plug for, um, is, is Rich Stone in here? Rich General Stone, are you in here yet? He may not be here. He's on one of the panels. But Major General retired Richard Stone, um, you know, the former with the VA, but that was one of his pushes too, was how to get uh, our, our army personnel, whether uh, active duty, Compo 2, Compo 3, to help reinforce and undergird the VA mission because they have the, the workload, they just needed the personnel. And so he's now with Deloitte, but he did a tremendous job advocating for that very, very issue. Okay. So we've got right. one last question from the SMA. Okay. So you yes, know, this, this got to be the tough one. I got right. to throw it out. You having the inside track and information about personnel. You are responsible for all things people. You notice he had to say, "You are responsible." You are. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Probably the probably the best and toughest right. question you're gonna get this week. Final score this weekend at the game. <laughs> Ten to seven, Army. Ooh, go Army! All beat right. Navy. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I was breaking a sweat there for a minute. Hey, hey, team, if, uh, in all sincerity, thank you. Uh, one General Dingle, Sergeant Major, thank you for the opportunity. I'll close with one statement I already had. Resiliency and wellness that you lead as medical professionals is that protective blanket that our soldiers and families need, desire, enjoy, and it gives us the combat readiness edge that we need to win and fight our nation's battles. Keep giving a damn. Be you. Lead well. and Everything's going to go great. Go Army, beat Navy. Thank you.